So I would love for you to take us as far back as you possibly can. Let's start the education process. Uh, talk about some of the things from Federal Reserve, what inflation really is. Let's, let's start uh, educating some folks here today uh, and try to help some people really thrive here coming forward in, in 2024 and beyond. Randy, as I, I know your audience is largely uh, entrepreneurs. People have started their own small businesses. But as I talk to a lot of people, there's this general sense that something is wrong, something is broken. The problem is that fiat currency is being debased and that makes it impossible to save in dollars. Okay, but what in the world am I gonna do to try to help get myself and my family out of this situation that I, I see it coming, but what do I do? First, nobody panic. All right, everyone, welcome back to the Rich Mind Podcast. And today's episode, I'm super excited for. Uh, ever since this uh, guest has joined me on the calendar, as far as picking this date and time to join me today, uh, I've been super excited about this conversation. I'm always looking for somebody that can help challenge my own thoughts, my own thinking in terms of finances and how to, to achieve greater things in my life from a legacy standpoint, from a wealth standpoint. And I think I found that exact person today. Today, I've got with us Gary Brode. Gary is a founder of Deep Knowledge Investing. He's an experienced portfolio manager and hedge fund investor with 30 plus years of experience. He's a creative contrarian thinker, which we'll get into what that means. Uh, and that, that intrigues me a lot because I consider myself a contrarian thinker as well. He specializes in communicating well-researched ideas to sophisticated investors. And we'll get into a little bit more as far as the deep knowledge investing, uh, his firm that he's created, the content that he creates for folks to help them navigate the uncertainties as far as the financial world that, we, that we're doing out there today. He's, uh, he was brought to me by a friend of ours, our co-friend of ours, actually, Joel Solomon. So Joel, thank you very much for the introduction and super excited to get in this conversation. We're going to dive deep into some education. Uh, for those of you that may or may not know, the Rich Mind Podcast. So Rich, the rich part of the, the title of the Rich Mind Podcast is all about financial education. I firmly believe that if you can get your head wrapped around basic financial terms, where different things are coming from. We'll talk about inflation today. We're going to talk about the Federal Reserve. If you can get your head wrapped around some basic ideas of financial education, you can really set yourself up and your family up to really thrive in the coming years versus being taken advantage of. Uh, we'll talk about those things as well. But without further ado, Gary, man, welcome to the show. It's going to be a lot of fun. Thanks, Randy. I appreciate you having me. Yes. So I went through a few of the bullet point lists right there. I didn't go through all the details about yourself, but I'd love for you to just take a few minutes and introduce yourself. Tell folks a little bit more about yourself and uh, what you're doing over there at Deep Knowledge Investing. Sounds good. Well, so I, I went to the University of Michigan and my first job out of school was doing mergers and acquisitions at Morgan Stanley. That was the two-year analyst program back in those days. We did not have people saying, you know, you can't work more than a certain number of hours a week. You know, we were working 80 to 100 hours a week or more. Uh, it was difficult, but it was great training. After that, I wanted to go work on the buy side. Uh, and so I went to work for Doug Hirsch at Smith Newcourt. Uh, and then he brought me with him when he started Seneca Capital. We were doing risk arbitrage, special situations, event-driven investing. Over the next few decades, I worked for and ran a variety of other hedge funds. Um, focusing on a wide variety of disciplines. I did concentrated long only investing, long short equity, event driven investing. Most recently, before starting Deep Knowledge Investing, I ran Silver Arrow Investment Management with my partner, Raji Kabaz. Um, we were a concentrated long only fund with options based hedging. And uh, I'm proud to say that our long return on invested capital beat the S&P 500 by almost 100 percentage points over those eight years. Um, and then January of 2020, I launched Deep Knowledge Investing. And what I do is I take the same methodology that I used in putting up outsized returns when I was working for and running hedge funds, and I communicate those to other hedge funds, family offices, registered investment advisors, and individuals, including people who may have, you know, just a few tens of thousands of dollars in a Schwab account or an E-Trade account or a Robinhood account. We focus on a limited number of very high probability, high return stock picks. I'm proud to say, and, and a little dumbfounded by the fact that we have more stock picks that have returned 100% or more 
then we have positions that have lost us money. Uh, no idea if I can do that again over the next five years. That's pretty tough, but I, I think it's a, a testament that the methodology works, the kind of research and due diligence we do works. And, you know, basically anyone who's been part of deep knowledge investing for any length of time, you know, I think they've made a lot more money with us than they paid in subscription fees, which is how I want it. People should be, they should be paying me and doing better themselves. And that's how we know it's working. Adding value to your community. That's what it's all about, right? That's where that exchange comes in. And that's super important. You know, it's interesting that you mentioned that because a lot of people view finance as kind of this bloodless thing. It's not, you know, one of the things people forget on the other side of those positions or an accounting statement, they're individuals, they're people with kids, they're people with families, they're people who want to buy a home or keep a home, who want to retire. And um, my, my subscriber community, they're really a remarkable, wonderful group of people. And um, every now and then, you know, I get this great email or text message from one of them saying, you know, hey, I invested in this idea you suggested and it worked out well. And it's just that, that sense of happiness and satisfaction that I feel when I know that somebody's more secure financially, that their retirement is in better shape, or that they're just better off for having been part of deep knowledge investing. It, is, it, it makes me feel amazing. And that is amazing. So congratulations. So I mentioned at the very beginning about being a contrarian thinker, and I love that. Uh, when I read that in your little bio, I just for myself, because I consider myself a contrarian thinker. Uh, and what that means, folks, is I just think differently than what you're normally fed, like the, the beliefs and the ideas and the systems that you're told that are true. I try to come at them with a thought of, okay, is that true? And just challenging those thoughts, challenging those ideas. And that's where I've been able to make some decisions from, from my own financial standpoint that have, have benefited. And it sounds like that's exactly what you're doing there at Deep Knowledge as well. I love the idea. I love the idea to the thought of, the Wayne Gretzky quote, I don't know if you're familiar with it or not, and I'm probably going to botch it up, right? But the idea is that, you know, he was asked many years ago, Wayne, how, how are you so great at this sport of hockey? And he said, I was always skating to where the puck was going versus to where the puck was. And that's kind of how I look at, as far as my financial situation in my own life, I look, try to figure out where things are going versus where they are currently. So anyways, yeah, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Please, please continue. No, I'm, I'm actually really glad you gave the definition of contrarian that you did. So many people view being a contrarian as being against conventional wisdom, that you always take a position opposite of where other people are. And that's doing that is a bad idea. And the reason is most people aren't dumb or wrong all the time, right? That in general, conventional wisdom tends to be right. The things that most people tend to believe tend to be right. And so you don't want to take a bet against them. I really like the way you defined it, Randy, as just thinking differently. And, you know, for people who are, whether you're new to investing or an experienced investor, I think this is an important message because the way I think about it is where you have the opportunity to earn outsized returns are those moments when you realize, oh, wait, everyone does have this wrong. And they don't come, they don't come that often, right? Again, everybody's not dumb and wrong all the time. That's not, you know, it's, most people are pretty smart and they handle themselves pretty well, um, especially in the stock market where there's a lot of money on the line. But, you know, every now and then you find these opportunities where the dominant narrative is incorrect. The things that people are saying to each other or reading in the newspaper don't have it right. And so, you know, for people who are curious, one great example, we made a ton of money in 2020 and 2021 buying HCA. It's a hospital company. And in July of 2020, half the market thought HCA was going to go bankrupt, right? Because it was going to be all COVID and the hospitals were shut down and nothing was going to work. And I knew this was wrong for two reasons. One is the idea that all of our high-end medical infrastructure was going to be permanently devoted to COVID, all COVID all the time, that, that doesn't make sense. People have heart attacks, people get cancer, people need joint replacements, people have all kinds of other health problems and diseases. And the idea that our, you know, our entire medical infrastructure was just going to be COVID permanently, that, didn't, that just didn't make sense. The other thing is the US government worried that the hospitals would go out of business, had sent HCA $6 billion. They weren't going to go out of business. And in fact, 
they so much weren't going to go out of business that one or two quarters later, they called the government and they said, yeah, we don't need the $6 billion. And they sent it back. I mean, imagine that. They just said, we don't need this. They sent it back. Earnings were off the charts high. And, uh, you know, we were buying the stock in July and then we were buying it again in September. Uh, I want to say at $115, something like that. And the following summer, about 11 months later, we sold it for 250 And the, the, the business hadn't changed. It's a hospital business. You know how hospitals work, right? You know, you go in and they overbill you. That's how hospitals work. But the fact that so many, the stock was trading like they were going to go out of business, it was a misperception. And so it was the ability to just look at the same information everyone else did and draw a different conclusion. That was, that was the contrarian move there. And, you know, it was more than a double and, you know, we made more than a hundred percent on that. And in my opinion, took very little risk in doing so. And you, you look for things like that. And, you know, the, the kind of thing where you can find something like that a few times a year. I'm not going to find that once a week, right? People aren't that wrong and that magnitude every week. But can I find a few of those a year and, you know, build a business off of helping people get phenomenal returns in that? Yeah, that's, that's what we've done. Love it. So that's the whole idea with this episode today, Gary, is in, the, in our pre-discussion here was to try to help folks see things maybe differently than what they've believed up to this point, be a little contrarian, just give them some different context as far as how the financial system works, uh, getting as detailed as we possibly can, but keeping it as simple as we possibly can as well. I think that the, between the two of us, based on our education and what we've done for ourselves, I think that the two of us in a conversation can really help some folks really recognize, number one, that the systems are the system that's been put in place from a financial standpoint. It's broken and it's not doing well, but there's reasons why it's not doing well. And if you, and if you understand them in a, from a contrarian standpoint, you can make some decisions for your own financial standpoint that will help you thrive versus suffer during, during certain circumstances. So I would love for you to kind of Take us as far back as you possibly can. Let's start the education process. Uh, talk about some of the uh, things from um, the Federal Reserve, what inflation really is. I mean, I don't want to go into too many of the bullet points that we've discussed, but yeah, let's let's start uh, educating some folks here today uh, and try to help some people really thrive here coming forward in, in 2024 and beyond. That sounds good. And it's really important. You know, Randy, as I, I know your audience is largely uh, entrepreneurs. People have started their own small businesses, and that's fantastic. You know, I talk to a lot of people like that. And in fact, half my board of advisors are all entrepreneurs. They've started their own businesses. They're growing them. Uh, they're really a group of incredible, bright, driven people. Um, but as I talk to a lot of people, there's this general sense that something is wrong, something is broken. And, you know, th because they're entrepreneurs, they believe in this, you know, the, kind of that great American story of, okay, things are hard. What do you do? You, you pull yourselves up by your bootstraps and you work harder and you find a way to make it work. Now, here's the thing, Randy. I think that is a great attitude. It's a great way to go through life. I'm a big believer in that American dream and that American attitude of if we work hard enough, we can find our way through this. And what I'm seeing is as I talk to people, they just feel like the deck is stacked against them. And so for the people, you know, who feel that way, the thing that I want to convey to you is you have these feelings, these negative feelings, and you wonder, hey, is it me or whatever? So you're right. The deck is stacked against you. There are things going on that are designed to make it difficult for you to succeed. There are reasons why that pull yourself up by the bootstraps approach has not been so effective this time around. And so just as a starting point, you guys aren't crazy. Those feelings you have are based on something real and there are real things going on here. Now, that doesn't mean that we give up. I am not telling anybody give up. What I am telling you is what you're experiencing, what you're dealing with is not your fault, but it is your responsibility to deal with it. So what our goal is for the day is to help you understand what's going on, help you see behind the curtain and understand in what way things are arrayed against you. Because once you understand that, there are things that can be done. So, you know, I, I realize a lot of what I'm about to tell you 
is going to be unpleasant. Nobody get depressed, nobody get upset. I promise you there are solutions. There are ways to deal with these things and we'll get to it. But in order for those things to make sense, I think it's really important to give people a sense of, of what's happening and what's going on and why they feel like things are stacked against them. How's that sound to you? Absolutely. I'm nodding my head if you're watching on video, because yes, that's exactly what I would love to do. So yes, please continue. All right. So here's the key thing. Let's go back sort of to our formative years when it comes to finance and what are the basic lessons that you know our parents or our mentors taught us. It was, you know, spend less than what you make and save that money or invest that money. And that, by the way, that's great advice. It's a whole lot better than overspending and having to pay credit card fees, right? Because who wants to pay that kind of interest? The problem is that fiat currency is being debased and that makes it impossible to save in dollars. Now, I realize I probably just used a bunch of terms there that are foreign to people, don't worry, we're going to unravel all of that, okay? So fiat currency simply means a government-sponsored currency. That would not have been the U.S. dollar, you know, 150 years ago when it was backed by gold, right? But what happened was a little over 100 years ago, we had the creation of the Federal Reserve. And then that, you know, they basically had control of a large chunk of the money supply and a lot of the way money is created. And then Roosevelt confiscated the gold of Americans, but they, you know, they gave people paper, but immediately they devalued it. Right. So that, you know, I don't remember the exact numbers, but it was something like, you know, we'll buy your gold from you, you know, for like $24 an ounce. And then, you know, as soon as the government had all the gold, they devalued it by 40%. Right. They gave you paper, but the paper was worth less than the gold. So right there, everyone took a 40 percent haircut. But you were holding a piece of paper that theoretically was exchangeable for gold, except the government wouldn't let Americans hold gold. Then in 1971, realizing that uh, the U.S. had issued a lot more paper than we had gold and people were asking for gold and that was not sustainable. We didn't have enough gold to give to everybody. President Nixon took us off the gold standard. So now what you have when you hold a dollar is something backed by faith and credit. Now, I don't know about you, but the credit of the U.S. government were $36 trillion of on-balance sheet debt plus off-balance sheet liabilities of about $200 trillion. Off-balance sheet liabilities are things like Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, pensions, all the things, all the obligations that we've incurred but haven't had to pay for yet. So if you add them together... That comes to something close to $250 trillion or a quarter of a quadrillion dollars. So that can't be paid. It won't be paid. So I'm going to say the credit of the U.S. government is approximately zero. And the only thing I have faith in is that they're going to continue to debase the currency. That's just a fancy way of saying they're going to make it worth less. And we're experiencing that in, in inflation. And we'll get back to that. We'll talk about it. So fiat currencies are government currencies. The dollar is a fiat currency, the British pound, the euro, the Japanese yen, the Mexican peso, right? The, the Cordoba uh, and, you know, the Peruvian soul. These are all fiat currencies. We'll contrast them with harder uh, forms of money, things like gold, silver, Bitcoin, right? The, those are not fiat currencies, right? Those all have a certain amount of value. Uh, and, and the difference is they're hard. And what hard means is hard to duplicate. So the supply of gold goes up by uh, roughly one and a half percent a year, some years a little more, some years a little bit yeah, less. Bitcoin, as of the last halving, is more hard than gold, meaning the inflation rate there is actually lower than gold. Now, uh, the U.S. dollar, something like um, 80 percent of all dollars in existence have been printed since 2020. That's not hard. And if the government decides they want to print another trillion dollars today and spread it out through the economy, they can do that. But there's a cost to that. That makes your dollars worth less. That's what we say when we're talking about debasing the currency. So what all of this means is that you can't save in dollars. The things that we were all told 
you know, that made sense are no longer accurate. And the reason is because the government is spending more and more and more. So Randy, when people talk about inflation, what they typically are thinking about is an increase in the price level, right? If you went to go buy, you know, milk at the grocery store a year ago and it was two and a half dollars and you go to the grocery store this year and it's four dollars. And by the way, I was in the grocery store over the weekend. I swear I saw an eight dollar gallon of milk. Mm. Uh, I, you know, I was in the the um, I walked into a CVS last month. I saw a twelve dollar bottle of mouthwash and, you know, looking at the price of a box of cereal will either make you laugh or cry. Right. That's how people <laughs> think about inflation. I, and, and that's, that's accurate, but I want to shift the way people think about it a little bit. So the original definition of inflation was an increase in the money supply. That's what inflation is. So when Congress overspends by $2 trillion or this year, maybe closer to $3 trillion. And you know, that we're not being taxed on that. What they're doing is they are monetizing that. And that's just a fancy way of saying the government is issuing debt and then putting that cash into the economy. Um, that in, they're increasing the supply of dollars by a few trillion dollars. But when you increase the supply of money without increasing the goods and services available, we experience that as higher prices, right? And so the old saying is, uh, a larger number of dollars chasing a the same or a smaller number of goods and services. Of course, prices go up. So the way I would love for people to think about inflation, I would love for you to think about it as a decline in the purchasing power of the dollars that you hold. So let's imagine you have $100 or $1,000 in your bank account right now. You can buy a certain amount of goods and services. Okay, ready for the first quiz of the day. Randy. A year from now, three years from now, five years from now, is that $100, that $1,000, are you going to be able to buy more or less with it? With inflation the way it is these days, it's going to be a lot less. Exactly. So this is, this is the reason that people are suffering. You can't save in dollars. You think you've saved money and you may have more dollars. Right. You know, if if you have your money in a checking account, you know, or sorry, a savings account, and it might be earning two percent or three percent, you know, OK, great. So at the end of a year, your thousand dollars turns into a thousand thirty dollars. But I'm going to tell you something, whatever you were going to buy with a thousand dollars, you're not going to be able to buy with a thousand thirty dollars in a year. You may have more dollars, more fiat dollars, but your purchasing power is declining every year. So you can't save in dollars. And that's a huge part of the problem. The other thing that's happening is the government is overspending and that adds to GDP. And so one of the, you know, one of the things that we look at at Deep Knowledge Investing is where the dominant narrative is wrong. And so you know, raise your hand if you have seen a hundred articles in the last year from the press and politicians chastising Americans for not being more grateful for the wonderful economy we have, right? They're all telling us, how, how whore are you people? Why, why aren't you more grateful? Right? Well, the answer is it's not a great economy. And the people say, well, but GDP is up. You know, we, we had GDP up 2%. Oh, was it? Right? That 100% of that increase is coming from excessive government spending, whether it creates value or not. Okay? So what, like what the government is capable of doing, they could take a trillion dollars and hire a ton of people to go dig holes. And then they take another trillion dollars and hire a whole bunch of other people to fill in those holes. Now, here's what happens. All of those people, we, the, the government can claim, well, they have jobs. They're not, they're not on unemployment. Okay, fair enough, but they haven't created any value. They can say, we added $2 trillion to GDP. Well, yeah, but you haven't created any value. And then when they spray that $2 trillion into the economy without creating goods, services, or value, or in this case may have just destroyed value, we experience all of that as an increase in prices. And so, you know, if you guys want to know how badly the deck is stacked against you, realize that this was a choice. Like, you know, Randy, let's go back to when you and I were much younger, when we were kids. Um, and 
the listen, I'm in favor of small government and low taxes. I'm not a fan of the government confiscating my money and using it in ways that I believe to be unwise. But as a country, we used to have these conversations. And here's how those conversations would take place. You would have politicians that would say, well, you know, I'm in favor of programs to do A, B, and C, but in order to fund those programs, we're going to have to tax you. And at the end of the year, you'd get around at April 15th and people would sit at their kitchen table and they would have to write a check. And the pain of doing that would force a conversation. The whole country was having conversations of, is this worthwhile? Does this make sense? Right? Are we getting value for this? Do we like this program? And it forced people to have real conversations about the proper size and scope of the government and what they were willing to fund and what they were willing to pay for. And if you thought there were programs that the government should be engaging in that they weren't, you would go vote for a politician promising bigger government. And if you thought that you were writing a check too big and the things the government was doing was not wise, you would vote for somebody who promised you smaller government. And it forced us as a country to make these choices, to feel that discomfort, to tie the check that we wrote to the services that we received from the government, and we would vote accordingly. And that's not actually a bad way to do things. Well, here's what they've been doing in recent years. They've decided, no, we don't need to do that anymore. The problem is nobody likes taxes and we don't want to cut spending. And so they've decided to fund everything through inflation. And that's why we've seen the national debt go up as much as it has, right? I mean, I think if I'm remembering right, if we go back to 2007, this is from memory, so somebody can check me, you know, correct me if I'm wrong. But I think the national debt was something like $8 trillion. And, you know, in just uh, four presidential administrations, we've gone to $36 trillion. And, you know, now interest expense, I think next year interest expense is going to be $1.5, $1.6 trillion. You know, this is, this is beyond enormous. And the reason they do this is because they're now funding the government through inflation, right? We don't make these choices anymore. So whatever it is, guns, butter, bread, circuses, wars, a social safety net, open borders, you know, we've all seen the stories about the people coming across the border and they're immediately put in hotels and given, you know, uh, food stamps and all kinds of benefits. And in New York, they were handing people $5,000 debit cards. Now, if you're listening to this and you're thinking, good, we should be doing that. Okay, fine. You're entitled to that point of view. I'm just pointing out that you're paying for it. You're paying for it every time you go to the grocery store right? You're paying for it every time you have to buy something. When you say, how did this get so expensive? Why are my property taxes going up? Why does it cost so much to have somebody mow my lawn? You know, why does it cost me so much to go buy these things that were so much cheaper? Why is my grocery bill up? The, the Bureau of Labor Statistics is telling us food inflation has been between one and 2% for the last two years. I don't believe it. I don't know anyone who believes that. You know, again, if, if you're listening to this and your grocery bill is up only 2%, I want to hear from you because you will be the first person to, to ever meet that standard. And so, listen, some of you who are listening to this think these programs are fantastic and you think they're things we should fund. Fair enough. Great. You're entitled to your point of view. I'm just pointing out, I'm not telling you that your programs are wrong or bad. I'm not telling you if you're listening to this that your political views are wrong or bad. I'm telling you that they are funding it through inflation. And the reason Congress does it, and the reason this White House does it, is because they don't have to take responsibility for it. Most people are not financially literate. These are not things, there's not ideas that are taught in school. Or if they are, they're being taught a form of economics that is just, it's not accurate. Um, they'll tell people that, you know, you're, you're, Spending doesn't matter. Your debt doesn't matter. The deficit doesn't matter. We can just print more. It's, here we are, right? And so the reason they do this is because what do they do? They blame Vladimir Putin. They blame COVID. They blame supply lines. Now we're blaming greedy grocery stores. I, I got news for you. The net margins at Kroger are 1.4%. All right. So, you know, the answer on that one 
is if somebody steals a $10 item from Kroger, they got to sell $700 of stuff to make up that loss. The grocery stores did not all of a sudden become greedy. They are scapegoats. All of these people, all of these things. And listen, I, you know, I'm not a fan of Vladimir Putin, but he's not the cause of inflation. Spending out of Washington is. There are lots of reasons to dislike Vladimir Putin. And if you want to hate him, go for it. You can come up with tons of great reasons why he's a bad guy, but he's not the one who created inflation. And Washington, both parties, this is not a, a single party issue. Both parties overspend. And so they have set up this system so that they can spend on everything and anything and pretend that the cost of it doesn't exist or is being caused by those bad other guys. And that's why they do this. And this is why, you know, when people feel like the deck is stacked against you, this is why. This is, this is what's happening. And so, you know, Randy, let me just ask you, that's because that's, there's a lot to take in there. Uh, you know, is that a helpful explanation or, you know, do we need to go over parts of this in more detail? Well, let's try to even unpack it a little bit more. So as you were explaining that, I was trying to think of it in different terms or the ways, the ways that I even think about it sometimes as well. So you talk about purchasing power and I try to explain that to folks a lot within my family or even pe people in my close proximity. And the idea that it's not the, you, you mentioned about the gallon of milk. It's not the gallon of milk that changed. It's the amount of dollars that it takes to buy that gallon of milk is what's changed. So it's the increase in the amount of dollars is why that price has increased because the supply of the unit itself, the milk in this example, did not necessarily change. Now, if the supply were to increase in equivalent with the amount of monetary stimulus, then obviously that, that price would balance. But that's where they, the, it's the supply is being low. And then the increase in the monetary with the money and the currency is what's creating that, that price perception of the prices increasing when in fact, it's just the purchasing power of that currency unit of that dollar or whatever uh, currency you're using out there in the world. So that's one way that I try to explain it. Does, did that make sense to you, Gary, as far as how it, I try to do it? It does. Yeah. And, and I even think um, a little economic history is really helpful in understanding it. So, you know, we've looked at this um, in history, throughout history, there have been 775 fiat currencies, government currencies. They've all gone to zero. And the amazing thing is they all collapse under the same circumstances, overexpansion or too much debt. Does any of this sound familiar? Right. And so, you know, the, do people in Washington not know this? And I, I'm going to make an accusation here. And again, it's a bipartisan problem. But either the people in Washington know this and are ignoring the fact that this, this history cycle plays out in exactly the same way every time, or they don't know it, in which case they have no business having access to the purse strings. They have no business. How do you take that job without having any understanding of financial history, economic history? That's grossly inappropriate. This would be like somebody paying me to be the mechanic for their Ferrari. Like you went, if, if I were to say, yeah, sure, I can be a mechanic for your Ferrari. It's not going to go well, you know, and, and it would be a bad choice to hire me. But what business would I have telling people, yeah, I can do that work. The people in Washington have no business doing this work without understanding economic history. These things all play out the same way. And so it gets even worse, Randy, because what's happening right now was done intentionally. And I know like people, you know, wait a minute, that sounds like a conspiracy theory, but stick with me and, you know, I'll, I'll get through the explanation and see if you still think it sounds nutty because we can go to the exact things that people have said. So, you know, I identified two places where this has happened. You know, one was the creation of the Federal Reserve that was, you know, a little over 110 years ago. And that gave the government control of the money supply. Then you had Roosevelt confiscating the gold of Americans. And, you know, his whole New Deal program sounded great, but it was a vast increase in the size and scope of the government. And it created all these programs that have massive liabilities now. And so, again, if you're listening to this, you could say, well, wait a minute. These are good, important programs, right? We should have Social Security and take care of our elderly. We should have, you know, Medicaid and take care of our sick. Okay, fine. 
you're entitled to that point of view. I can see why you think that was a good idea. But those liabilities right now, those off balance sheet liabilities are $200 trillion. And we have an economy that's a little under $30 trillion, which means it can't be paid. So we are effectively bankrupt on that. And so like, are these programs, are these programs important? Are they helping people? Sure. Yeah. But should we all be bankrupt because of it? At what cost? And the problem with these kinds of Keynesian or modern monetary theory economics is we pretend that there's no cost, right? And that's, that's the issue. So if we go forward a couple of decades, you know, we end up with Lyndon Johnson and his great society, which was again, another massive expanse of government involvement in the economy. And, you know, unsurprisingly, we started to get some inflation. And what people remember, you know, for people who are, you know, maybe 50 years old or older, you'll remember the huge inflation and stagflation of the late 1970s. Remember the gas lines and, you know, the, the CPI going, you know, way into the double digits. And it was, there was something called the misery index, which was inflation plus unemployment. That was over 20%. So you know, people think about that in the late 1970s, but what they don't realize is that was roughly a 15 year experience. And that inflation actually started in the mid 1960s. So the chairman of the Federal Reserve at the time was a man named Arthur Burns. And, you know, the CPI, they were trying to get it down to around 2%. And the CPI was, you know, around 5% or so. And Lyndon Johnson wanted more stimulus, as all presidents do, right? This is, again, this is not a partisan thing. All presidents from both parties, they want low interest rates. They want a stimulated, uh, stimulated economy. They want great GDP numbers. They want a stock market to go up. Lyndon Johnson, of course, wanted this. And so he invited Chairman Burns to his ranch in Texas. And as the story goes, and by the way, Johnson, he was a large man. Uh, And the story goes, he picked up Burns and slammed him into a wall, which was apparently something that you could do at the time, (laughs) and and said to him, I want lower rates. Now, Burns, you know, for better or worse, I think he was a bit cowardly, and he caved, and he lowered rates, and he did that prematurely. And um, what happened was inflation came roaring back. And by the way, Randy, you know, I I would recommend take a look at this week's version of Deep Knowledge Investing's Five Things. There is a chart in it overlaying the inflation we've had in this country since 1913. Sorry, pardon me, 2013. So, you know, over the past 11 years. And when you lay it over uh, the inflation that we had from 1966 to, I think, 1979, it is an exact match. And where we are right now, and the Fed is going to lower interest rates tomorrow, that is exactly where we were when Burns lowered the Fed funds rate and inflation came roaring back. So it looks like we have inflation under control. We don't. And it looks like it's time for the Fed to lower rates. They shouldn't. And, you know, it just look at the history. Look, I mean, we've got the the chart. Credit to DKI intern Andrew Brown, who put it together. Great job, Andrew. Um, but you know, we've got this chart and if you take a look and see where the fed is lowering rates, it would be terrifying. So going back to the 1970s, the, the person who took over for Burns was Paul Volcker and Volcker desperately needed to get inflation under control, ran up the fed funds rate to somewhere in the neighborhood of 20%. Now, a lot of people are saying this is terrible. We've got a current fed funds rate right now is 5.3%. So try to imagine the Fed funds rate being three and a half to four X what we are now. And the reason we can't do that now, the reason Volcker was able to do that is the debt to GDP at the time was something like 25%. Now, you know, we've got debt to GDP of well over a hundred percent and interest expense is taking up, you know, more than a third of the budget. So, or it's maybe more than a quarter of the budget, whatever it is, it's, it's an enormous number. Um, so, you know, something like one and a half trillion dollars out of like six or seven trillion dollars of spending. This is a problem. So we can't do this now. So let's go forward in time. And we end up with Alan Greenspan, who 
you know, Greenspan was a smart guy. And, you know, he also was a free market guy, but he was chatty, right? He loved to talk in, in front of, you know, the Fed used to be sort of the secretive institution. Greenspan would tell people what he was thinking and he implemented never overtly what was called the Greenspan put. And what that was, was to tell people, yeah, listen, don't worry, you know, we're going to raise rates, but if the stock market goes down, I'll lower rates again. You'll all be fine. And, you know, hey, how would you like to invest in an environment where if you made money, it was your money, but if the market started to go down, the Fed was going to bail you out. That's a pretty good deal, except who's going to pay for it? It's a taxpayer who takes the guarantee on this stuff, right? And so, you know, when, when people talk about, wait a minute, it's capitalism if it goes up, but socialism if it goes down, right? The Greenspan put was the beginning of that. And then we saw that again in the, the great financial crisis, you know, of 2008, where the housing market collapsed. We saw that again during the COVID years, where the government took $6 trillion and sprayed it into the economy, right? And that was, by the way, the threat of the man who, who succeeded um, um, uh, Greenspan, right? It, it was uh, Ben Bernanke. And he was, they called him Helicopter Ben. And the reason was, he said, hey, if the economy's bad, we can stimulate the economy. We can just throw $100 bills out of a helicopter, right? Helicopter Ben. Well, great. Guess what? That's how you end up with irresponsible spending and inflation. But, the, but our government actually tried that in 2020 and 2021, right? And everybody thought, hey, this is great. The government's sending me money. We love our stimmies. Well, guess what? Guess everyone who's listening to this, guess who's paying for your stimmies? You are. The government didn't send you free money. They sent you $1,600, but they sent you $1,600 once. If your cost of living went up by $100 or $200 a month, well, that could be $2,400 at the end of a year, and you get that every year. So you'll be paying $2,400 more this year, $2,400 more next year. That's in perpetuity. You're paying for your stimmies over and over and over again. Anyway, so who came next? Janet Yellen. Janet Yellen was a horrible, horrible chairperson of the Federal Reserve. And, you know, Yellen, is she's a big MMT person. It's just a fancy way of saying modern monetary theory, which is, I'm going to sum that up for people. It is a series of economic beliefs consistent with what we're talking about here. Debt doesn't matter. Deficits don't matter. We can spend whatever we want and there's no cost to it. Well, Anyone who's looked at your grocery bill lately or tried to buy a car lately, you tell me there's no cost to it. We all know there's a cost to it, right? There's, we're paying for the cost. But Yellen actually said why she said this in public, I don't know. She actually came out and said, my biggest regret as chairperson of the Federal Reserve was not creating more inflation. Okay. Well, you know that. So are, are, you know, when I say to people this was done intentionally. And people say, oh, you're crazy. You're a conspiracy theorist. Are you sure? Let's keep going, right? Because the person who came next, Jerome Powell, right? And Powell put in place, first of all, he kept rates at or around zero for far too long. And that was a choice. And the reason he made that choice, he came out and he told us the Federal Reserve's target for inflation is 2%, which I will tell you is 2% too high. The real mandate, the proper mandate of the Federal Reserve is stable prices. Ready for quiz number two of the day? Randy, stable <laughs> prices means a, a inflation rate of what? Zero. There you go. 2% is 2% too high. And people can say, well, 2%, what does it matter? The thing it cost you a dollar, next year it cost you a dollar two cents. Do you really care? Yeah, you care because that compounds over time. A 2% inflation rate will take more than half of the value of your savings over a 40 year working life. Yeah, you care about 2%. But what Powell did was he came out and he said to people, listen, we've been below 2% for a long time. I don't think the 2% target is right. I think we should be 2% over time. And he clarified that what he meant by that was we're below, we've been below 2% for a while. So now we want to be above 2% for a while so that over time it will average out to about 2%. So our last two Federal Reserve chair people, one said, my biggest regret is not creating more inflation. The other one said, 
we want to have inflation running above 2%, even though that's the target. And even though that target is 2% too high, are we sure this wasn't intentional? Because I'm telling you, this was 100% intentional, right? And so this is, this is the history of all of this. All of these moves were done intentionally. They were done on purpose. And now we're all in a situation where it costs us a fortune to get anything done. And you can't save in dollars. And for those of you listening to this thinking, why is it so hard? Why could our grandparents have, you know, one earner, a stay at home, you know, care, caretaker, usually mom at the time, you know, our 2.5 kids and a house and a car or two, and, you know, a couple of vacations here. And why, why doesn't this, why doesn't this work? I've explained to you historically the reason why. Now, here's the worst part of all of this. None of it is going to change. There is nobody that you can vote for in November that has a plan to fix this or even wants to fix it. Neither party has a plan to cut spending. Neither presidential candidate has a plan to cut spending. Now, I'm not telling you this election doesn't matter. There are lots of things that matter. And as you're listening to this, you're thinking to yourself, well, wait a minute, but I care about this issue and that issue. Okay, great. I think you should have lots of issues you care about. You go vote for the person who is the closest match to your values. That's great. What I'm telling you is that neither presidential candidate nor anybody running for Congress outside of you know the Paul family, right, Rand Paul, has any plan to cut spending. So these trends that we've seen are going to continue. Now you know that, and now you know that it's intentional. This has been a multi-decade plan to devalue the dollar, and this is the same thing that happened with the British Empire, the Spanish Empire, the Roman Empire. This, these things all go the same direction for the same reasons. It is done intentionally, and it's not going to stop. And so, you know, again, for those of you listening to this, wondering why is this so hard? Why, like, I'm working so hard and so focused, and I can't get ahead. This is the reason you cannot save in dollars. And this is being done intentionally, and it's not going to change. And so now that you know that, what are you going to do with that information? And when I tell you it's not your fault, you know, I'm, I'm not encouraging people to take that black pill and curl up in a ball and say, well, it's all hopeless, right? It may not be your fault, but it is your responsibility to do something about it, to save yourself, your family, the people close to you, your employees, your business, your customers. There are things that you can do and there are things that you should do. And so, you know, know that the situation is not your fault, but that does not free us from responsibility for figuring out what to do with it. So folks, don't leave us yet, because before we end this episode, we're going to talk into some specifics that you can do starting today, starting this week, starting as soon as you possibly can to try to get yourself ahead of what's coming. As I mentioned in the very beginning, the, the Wayne Gretzky quote, quote, as far as like skating to where the puck's going versus where it is. I think a lot of times we get stuck and I, sweet, and I say we, I mean us collectively as humans, we get stuck worrying about the day-to-days, the headlines all the drama and, and stuff that's going on out there in the world. And we're not thinking about what's, what's happening now is going to affect the future, the cause and effect. Now, if you understand the cause, which is what Gary just went through very detailed, and I loved every second of it. That was fantastic, Gary. Thank so thank you. you very much. But the idea is that I, I wanted you to hear that from someone that knows, knows what he's talking about and is planning for the future. And I'm doing that for myself as well. And we will uh, definitely leave you with some, some nuggets of wisdom as far as some things that you could do to uh, take some action before we uh, wrap up today. But one thing I wanted to point out, Gary, and I just want to get your opinion on it. We don't have to go too far into detail, but you mentioned as far as Janet Yellen being one of the worst Federal Reserve chairmen of all time and how important it is right now that she's actually in charge of the Treasury of the United States. Just briefly, and as Simple as you possibly can. Can you just maybe even tie that one in there too, as far as how we've got the Jerome Powell is currently the Federal Reserve Chairman, but then the person that's in charge of quote unquote the like the checkbook of the United States is a formal Federal Reserve Chairman herself that you proclaim this, and I'm not going to say she was or wasn't, but at the same time, yes, she was not very good for us as a country, but she's in charge of basically the checkbook of the United States. Can you just briefly touch on that just a few minutes? I think that would be super powerful right now as well. Yeah, you know, Randy, what you brought up is what I refer to as the Thomas Sowell problem. Sowell was a fantastic economist 
at the Hoover Institute in Stanford. And, um, you know, one of the things he talks about is that when people do horrible, damaging things in government, they, they're never held accountable. And so Yellen did horrible, damaging things and somehow managed to fall into being secretary of the treasury. Now, one of the things I've written about at length over the last couple of years is the, the quiet war between Powell and the Federal Reserve on one hand and Congress and the White House and the Treasury on the other. So what Powell and the Fed are trying to do is get inflation down and get it under control. And the reason why, even though we've had, you know, 22, 20, holy wow, we've had three years of tighter policy from the Fed to try to get inflation under control. And so why, you know, why hasn't that worked? And, and it has a little bit. He's gotten inflation down some, but it's still a problem. And the reason for that is because overspending out of Congress and the White House has offset that. So while the Fed has tried to constrict and, and slow growth in the economy to get the price index down, Congress has been spraying stimulus into it. And so they're working at cross purposes. Um, and, you know, I, I wrote uh, an ebook on this, uh, you know, uh, a couple of years ago called Counterintuitive Inflation. And it was how, sorry, it was actually a year ago on how Federal Reserve rate hikes actually can cause more inflation because we're going to end up with more interest expense. Um, this is the thing that, you know, Lynn Alden, who's somebody who I respect a lot, I like and respect Lynn, her work is fantastic. She refers to it as fiscal dominance and basically saying we're at the point where it doesn't so much matter what the policy is out of the Federal Reserve, the fiscal policies of Congress and the White House are, have become so massive in, uh, in, in contrast to the size of the system that nothing the Federal Reserve does is really going to matter that much. And so, you know, somebody could say, okay, wait, but you were talking about Yellen. How is this her responsibility? And the answer is, as Secretary of the Treasury, she's the one who's monetized all of this. She's the one issuing all the debt to fund all of this. And one of the things that she's done is she shortened the duration curve. No one panic. It's just a fancy way of saying that as old debt has rolled over and needed to be refinanced, she's refinanced with shorter duration. So for example, you know, typically if a 10-year bond rolled over and it was time to refinance it, the government might say, okay, well, we'll issue another 10-year bond, but that's not what's happening. Right. So Yellen has gone more toward the short end of the curve and is issuing more one and two year paper. And you think, OK, wait, why does that matter? Well, the reason it matters is because the 10 year bond, you only need to refinance once every 10 years. If you do it, if you refinance it with one year debt, you have to refinance that 10 times. And over time, the size of your treasury auctions get larger and larger and larger. And what we're seeing are record tails. Now, I'm going to explain that. That is a, just a fancy way of saying that the pricing on the auction is coming in below where the government expected it to be. And the tails have been really large. And what that means is that foreign demand for U.S. treasuries is not keeping up with the issuance of all those treasury securities. Secretary Yellen is the one in charge of that. My friend Lex Ganapathy at Unicus Research has hilariously Describe Janet Yellen as the Marie Antoinette of our inflation. And, uh, you know, round of applause to, you know, other DK intern, Alex Petra, who uh, did this hilarious AI image of Janet Yellen and uh, Marie Antoinette standing in the middle of a grocery store with, a, you know, holding cake, like let them eat cake. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's the issue. And so everybody's very excited. You know, that tomorrow, and it's today is September 17th, you know, tomorrow the Federal Reserve is going to cut the Fed funds rate. People are excited about that. But none of this is going to change the fact that Congress is overspending and the dollar will continue to be debased. Again, that's just a fancy way of saying that the dollars in your account today are going to be worth less a year from now. That's the direction we're heading. And knowing that direction, folks are out there listening to us right now saying, okay, Gary, I hear you. I, I kind of get what you're saying. I, I understand that 
I need to think a little contrarian to what I've normally been thought to believe and to hear out there in the normal society. So now what am I going to do about it? And we've talked about there are different ways and different things you can do to save uh, outside of dollars. You've mentioned that more than once here today on this episode. Let's take a few minutes as we start to bring this one in for a close. Let's leave the folks with, uh, we've painted a little bit of a dark picture as far as the, uh, the future. But if you can see this for what it is and for what's happening, once again, you can skate to where that puck's going, make some decisions immediately as soon as you get done with this episode. In, still increase your education, learn from more from Gary. I, I've been out there listening to Gary on, on do, uh, different episodes out there as well. He's talking about this a lot. And we'll talk about how you can get connected with his deep knowledge in, investing email newsletter as well, which is fantastic content. Okay. But the idea is folks are saying, okay, I understand. But what in the world am I going to do to try to help get myself and my family out of this situation that I, I see it coming, but what do I do? Right. Okay. Yeah. First, nobody panic. No one panic. There are things you can do. There are things you're going to do. And there are ways to get through all of this. Okay. What you should expect is continued inflation. Now, you're going to see a lot of talk that the U.S. is going to enter a recession, already entered a recession, and people are going to talk about deflation. Yeah, that could happen. I doubt it. The recession, yes. Uh, deflation, I doubt it. But if it happens, it's, it's a head fake, right? Long term, you're going to be facing more inflation. Like, you know, could prices come down in certain parts of the economy for a year or two? Yeah, but don't count on it. And over the next three, five, 10, 20 years, you're going to look at large increases in the price indexes. So more price increases are coming. That means the purchasing power of your dollar will be down. All right, let's talk about what to do. First of all, that doesn't mean don't save. That doesn't mean spend everything. When I tell you that you can't save in dollars, please do not say, okay, great. Now we're going to spend everything we make, right? That's, that's not a good response. I, I will continue to advise people, do all that you can, if you're able to, to live below your means, right? Try to, try to save money. Try not to spend too much. That's that kind of prudence that the government doesn't avail itself of is something you should do. All right, but now what do you do? Let's start with basic security, right? Basic security is you should be secure at home. And if you don't have at least several months of food and water supplies, that's the place to start, right? And so it doesn't have to be expensive. You know, listen, if, if you have plenty of money, then great. Get yourself a nice freezer and start freezing, you know, plenty of meat and fish, you know, make sure you pack it properly. Okay, terrific. But let's, you know, let's say you don't have enough money to go, you know, fill a freezer with, you know, filet mignon, right? That's all right. Basic things, go to Costco, start buying 20 pound bags of rice, start buying large amounts of beans, um, you know, canned tuna fish, things like paper towel, toilet paper, cleaning supplies. The kinds of things that you would need if supply lines went down. Remember, we have a candidate for president talking about price controls in supermarkets. I promise you, while that sounds good, you will not end up with lower prices at the supermarket. You will end up with a lack of supply in the supermarket, and then you're going to buy your goods in the black market, and that's going to cost you more. So don't, you're going to end up with shortages. Don't get caught with that in that situation. You know, having canned foods uh, or inexpensive things like rice and beans, that's, that is insurance that you're not going to go hungry. And that is the first place to protect yourself. Now, you know, one of the things I like doing when I'm investing, I like to be in situations where if I'm wrong, I don't pay a big penalty right? I like to be in situations where if I'm right, I'm going to make a lot of money and do well. If I'm wrong, I'm not going to lose a lot. Okay. So for those of you who are skeptical, the penalty, if I'm wrong, is a year from now, you're going to be eating some extra tuna fish and you know, you'll find interesting things to do with rice and beans, and you're going to have some extra toilet paper, which does not expire. So you want to be in these asymmetrical situations. You want to be in a situation, where, okay, if I'm wrong, you'll have too much tuna fish. You know, is that the end of the world? No, you'll figure it out. You'll make casseroles, you make sandwiches, it'll all be fine, right? All right, 
Now, let's say you've got that covered. I want you to think about things if, again, if supply lines go down, if supermarkets close, I want you to think about things that you could use for barter. Things like sugar, salt, coffee, chocolate, good whiskey, right? These are all things that you can stockpile and you don't have to throw $10,000 at this. You know, these are things that $50 at a time, even $25 at a time, you can start to pack away some of these things where if you need it for barter, I mean, you know, it, it's if, for those of you who own gold, great, but you're not going to go buy these things with a gold coin, right? Having some things like that, again, when we talk about protection, we start at home. Now let's go to the next level, precious metals. Um, I do own a little bit of silver, but that market I believe is highly manipulated. Gold is better. You know, you should own, you should own some gold. Now, some of you may say, well, wait a minute, you know, what's the price of gold is something like, you know, ballpark $2,600 for an ounce. And if you want to go buy gold coins, you know, they charge a premium for that it might be $2,700, $2,800. And some of you might be saying, okay, wait a minute. I don't have that much just, you know, free to go buy gold. That's okay. You don't have to do that. You can go into the stock market and there are uh, precious metal ETFs, right? So for gold, GLD is one of the tickers and you could go buy gold $25 at a time, you know, $50 at a time, you know, do it, do it every week, you know, every week go buy $25 worth of gold and save because gold is hard. Hard means difficult to duplicate. And so the value of that will go up against the dollar. It'll be worth more in dollars over time. So as dollars lose pricing power and purchasing power and gold doesn't, the dollar price of your gold will go up. What's really happening is your gold is holding its purchasing power. Your dollar is losing purchasing power. All right. Next thing. Uh, I'm a huge fan of Bitcoin. Now, some of you are going to be skeptical. That's fine. You're welcome to be skeptical. But without going into the whole, you know, crazy, I mean, I've, I've heard all the arguments and we're not going to do that here. The reason Bitcoin matters is because right now it's harder than gold. It's harder to duplicate than gold. The inflation rate on Bitcoin, the amount that supply is increasing is actually less than 1% per year. It is becoming more and more scarce. Now, some of you will say, okay, but it's not backed by anything. Uh, to which I'll respond, and what do you think is backing the US dollar? Hmm. Right? The US dollar with a quarter of a quadrillion dollars of liabilities against it, faith and credit. So if you want to stake your future on the faith and credit of an organization that has shown no ability to be responsible with its finances and is actively trying to create inflation, to reduce the value of your savings, you're welcome to do that. For the rest of you, if you don't know, if you're uncertain, take a 1% position, right? Be in a position where if it works, you make a ton of money. If it doesn't, you've taken a 1% loss and we can all stomach a 1% loss, right? That's something that you can do. Now, for people who are going to do this, I strongly advise self-custody. Now I realize that is scary and you know people don't know how to do it it can be confusing if it doesn't work you can't call 1-800 bitcoin and ask to talk to the manager right? I get all of that here's the good news deep knowledge investing can help you I have published this is available for free I have published and distributed a step by step guide to self custody and when I say step by step I mean fill in this box red arrow pointing push this button I have made it absolutely as simple as possible. And if you're willing to devote, you know, an hour to this and just follow the instructions that I lay out, I promise you it's going to work. Well, let me, let me rephrase that. If, if you make a mistake, I can't promise you. If you follow the instructions, it will work. And there are ways to test it, right? Don't do it, you know, with your net worth. Do it with $10 at first. That's what I did. The first time I transferred Bitcoin into self-custody, I transferred $10. And then I saw that it worked. I'm like, okay, I know what I'm doing and I can do this. So that is available to you. Just reach out. We can help you with this. And by help you, I mean, I will send you the guide or I'll show you on, we've got it linked on Twitter. I've got it on my website. This is available for free and public. 
this is not knowledge that I want to hoard. I want more people to take control of their finances. I want more people to be financially secure. I care about that. I want people to be able to self-custody. We will help you with that at no charge. Um, The next thing, if you have a little more money, I want you to start thinking about investing in energy, right? Because energy is typically priced in dollars. So if the dollar is being debased, again, fancy way of saying the purchasing power of the dollar is going down, what do you think happens to the dollar price of things like oil? Right. And, you know, you don't want to own that. Own the pipelines. Those are phenomenal. Um, They have a, you know, a dividend yield of like 8%. Right. So, you know, that that very soon is going to be, you know, double where we are on, you know, like the 10 year treasury with growth and they're growing. Um, I also like uranium. You know, everybody is so excited about all these AI plays. If you're listening to this, I guarantee you've heard about NVIDIA over the last two years and their chips and, you know, companies spending tens of billions of dollars on AI chips. What do you think is going to power those? An AI related data center uses six to seven times the power of a regular data center. Data centers are taking up as much energy as individual cities. And if we don't, you know, as a society don't want more carbon emitting um, energy options, that is nuclear. And that's coming. And that market is hugely out of imbalance. And you want to know how to invest in that? We can help you with that. Finally, you know, the the final answer for me on all of this stuff is, you know, I invest in, like I said, a limited number of high growth stocks where we feel like there's the opportunity to make a multiple of our money. Uh, Our last two stock ideas at Deep Knowledge Investing, I think both of those have the potential to be up five to 10 times meaning you know 500 to 500% to 1000% returns um on capital invested now um over the next 5 years you know you get something like that to work with even 1% of your net worth or 2% of your net worth that will change things for you you know the pick we had before that was shockwave medical we were buying that in December at 191. The company was bought by Johnson & Johnson three and a half months later for 335. We made more than 70% on our money in under four months. You do enough things like that, things will work out. Now, I get that that last one, that may be a little advanced for people, and that's okay. It's okay. You don't have to be doing that. If you want help with that, we can help you with that. But the other stuff that I talked about, these are things that you can be doing to protect your home your assets, your business, your employees, your family, right? These are things that you can do to protect yourself against what's coming because we know what's coming. So you might as well be prepared, right? And, and these are all steps that are very simple to take. They don't require a great deal of knowledge. They don't require a great deal of preparation. You know, these are all things where if you sit down and think about it for an hour and make a list and do a little reading, you can execute on every one of the things that I just outlined with the exception of, you know, the stock picks and that, you know, that in my case is more than 30 years of experience doing it. But the other things I talked about, the basic things, they are available. If you're listening to this and you understand this podcast and you're one of Randy's listeners, these are things that you can do. Love it. And I just want to throw one more thing in there. And he he briefly touched on it there at the very end is self-education. Get yourself educated based on what we've talked about today. If any of the topics uh, are even still a little bit maybe over your head, go a little bit deeper. Do some searches. Uh, Find Gary on other podcast episodes. He goes into a lot more detail even about the markets. Uh, I've tried to keep this one with Gary. We talked about it before we hit record. A little bit more simple as much as we possibly can, trying to make sure that everybody understood certain terms. Uh, But even if it was a little bit up over your head, don't hesitate to go deeper educate yourself. That's where you can actually impact yourself the most. We talk about some financial things you can do, whether it's gold, silver, Bitcoin, even in stocks. But if you don't know what you're doing, you're going to make mistakes. And that's where getting people on your team, finding folks like Gary to help you in the process is going to be a huge benefit, more so than you can ever imagine, which is why I'm super excited that Gary decided to join us here today. I've been trying to, as I mentioned in the beginning, find somebody that could help me articulate what's going on 
even better that it's a lot of it's going on in my mind. I have struggles sometimes getting it out and making it make sense. And I, hopefully you found value in what Gary shared with us today. So first off, Gary, I just want to say thank you so much for taking your time out of your busy day to go into detail and start the process of trying to educate folks on really what's happening behind the scenes. I think of it like the wizard of Oz uh, movie, right? Where it's like the, the wizard is, is pulling, you know, you pull the curtain and you kind of seeing what's going on behind the scenes. And once you see it, you can't unsee it, and which gives you the opportunity then to make different decisions going forward. So uh, with that said, Gary, we talked about deep knowledge investing. If folks are interested in getting in contact with you and learning more directly, you talked about this uh, uh, as far as taking self with the Bitcoin, as far as buying Bitcoin and, and self. Tell me again, what you, what did you call that? Self? Self-custody. Self-custody. Yeah, I couldn't it, think of the word it, custody. <laughs> yeah, it just, it, all it means, Think think about it this way, Randy. If you have your money in a bank account, a savings account, a checking account, a CD, the bank has custody of those assets. If you take cash out of the bank and you put it in your pocket, you have custody. That's self-custody. So with Bitcoin, which is not a tangible thing, um, you know, you can buy one of the ETFs, stands for exchange traded funds and own it, or you can go on Coinbase and buy it and own it there. And the expression is not your keys, not your coins. What you are at that point, just like when you put money in the bank, it is the exact same thing. You are an unsecured creditor to a larger institution. Don't do that. Um, we recommend that people self-custody. And that means you take ownership of your Bitcoin. You control it. And you know there, there are ways to do it. There are hardware devices that can be used. None of this is expensive. It is scary to people only because you've never done it before, but the process of, you know, doing a little bit of research, doing an hour of reading, um, the process of going through that exercise of self-custody is valuable and it is not beyond you. If, if you are listening to Randy's podcast, it is not beyond you. It is something that you can do and we've helped plenty of people do it. So tell us where to get that report, Gary. Tell us where we can get in contact with you, learn more from you. I appreciate your time today. This has been great. Thanks. And, and Randy, thanks so much for having me. And, and to your audience, thank you so much for taking the time to listen to all this, right? We know your time is valuable. The fact that you've chosen to spend this hour or so with us is really meaningful. And, and I appreciate that. Um, feel free to um, find me at deepknowledgeinvesting.com. Um, there is a free subscription option. Please feel free to avail yourself of that. We provide all kinds of investor education and help people understand things like the GDP report, the CPI report, you know, all the things that are going on in the economy. We'll certainly be following tomorrow's Federal Reserve rate cut. Um, you know, for the people who are interested in actually making money from the stuff that we do, uh, the individ individual subscription will be fine. You'll see all the stocks that we've recommended as well as the research reports I've written. You'll be able to understand why. Listen, I have some people, they just copy my trades and that's fine. Um, but, you know, we make the reports available and updates available so that people can understand what they're buying and why. But it's your decision. It's your money. We don't take control of your assets, but we make subscriptions available to people for $100 a month or $1,000 a year. Uh, like I said, you know, we've, we've helped people earn a return. That's a multiple of that. Um, we don't make any guarantees because doing so is dishonest and investing. There's always some inherent risk, but the methodology that we use has been effective for a long time. The other thing is, you know, we don't believe in bad markets. One of my, the things I saw that greatly frustrated me, you know, in 2022, you saw these people saying, well, you know, we lost your money, your investment advisor saying we lost your money because it was a bad market. You know, my response is th that's not a thing. There's no such thing as a bad market. And why didn't you do something else? They could have gone to cash. They could. So what we did in 2022, we were preparing people for inflation in November of 21. And in November of 21, we were telling people buy food buy gold, buy oil, buy uranium, buy Bitcoin. Bitcoin was 15,000 when we told people to start buying it. Um, you know, these were things that we did to prepare people. And then for all of 2022, we were short the market and long energy. Those were the two huge positions. Those are the only two things that worked that year. So, 
you know, we don't, we don't believe in good markets or bad markets. We just believe that it's our job to find a way to make money for our subscribers, for our clients, no matter what the market is doing. And that's what we're focused on. Fantastic. So folks, if you would do Gary and I a favor, uh, share this episode with your family and friends. We're trying to get this information out to as many people as we possibly can to help try to educate people to understand, help them understand really what's happening in their lives. That as Gary said at the very beginning of this episode, it's not your fault, but it is your responsibility to take some different actions in your life. And hopefully with this episode, uh, we'll be able to help you understand a little bit better what's going on. Uh, Gary's even actually I mentioned that we possibly might be able to come back and do a separate episode, maybe go a little bit deeper if that is of interest. So if you wouldn't mind, leave us a review. Let me know. You can email me at randy at randywilsononline.com. Email me and let me know. What did you think about the episode? Did you learn a lot? Did you have more questions? Uh, what other questions did you have? And I can definitely pose those to Gary and we can have another conversation and go a little bit deeper possibly to try to explain what's really happening. So that way you can see what is happening, and then obviously take some evasive action as you possibly, as much as you possibly can. And that way you can uh, try to benefit from what's happening versus being swallowed up by it. So Gary, I think we're going to wrap it up there, man. I really appreciate your time. This has been a lot of fun and hopefully we'll get some feedback and then maybe we can get you back on. That'd be, that'd be a lot of fun. I'll look forward to that. Thank you. Fantastic. So folks go out there, have a fantastic day. Get yourself self-educated, uh, reach out to Gary, get these reports that he's talking about, go to deep knowledge, and get on his email list. And, uh, I promise you, you're going to be a lot better off in the future. If you start implementing some of the strategies we talked about today, and that'll be fantastic for you and your family going forward. So go out there, have a fantastic day. I look forward to coming back with Gary in the next episode and the next guest very soon until then. Bye now.